Well, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, scrutiny of my experience, and, and you know, um, I uh, used to be, you know, just outraged at, at being so questioned, but uh, I, I had to uh, realize that, uh, you know, this is pretty strong stuff, and uh, a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, people taking a hard look at it is, is warranted, you know. I agree with uh, Carl Sagan when he says, uh, Extraordinary claims de de uh, deserve extraordinary evidence. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, it's it's when people draw conclusions about the subject in general, or about my case in particular, uh, without having uh, referenced the the facts or all of the facts of the case, that I really take exception. You know, I think. Uh, it's uh, anyone's duty, you know, when examining any topic that, uh, of any importance in, in today's world, to first get the facts, you know. And uh, everybody's free to blather and blab out their opinion that they, as they want. And the Internet has made that abundantly clear. People are out there saying whichever and whatever. But, you know, there, there's a certain social responsibility that we all have to uh, know what we're talking about before we open our mouth. Well, the Hollywood experience was uh, a real awakening. You know, we all have a lot of <laughs> preconceptions about how that would be. And uh, to, to be honest, a lot of my uh, preconceptions were negative, and so I turned down a lot of offers uh, before Tracy Torme came along. And, you know, he persuaded me that uh, this would be an ideal opportunity to uh, allow people to uh, experience this thing as, um, as we did when it happened and uh, that that might, uh, you know, create a, a, a greater openness to, you know, taking a look at the facts, you know. And so, so I agreed. And, uh, you know, Tracy did fight hard to uh, get, uh, uh, get things, uh, keep things uh, as uh, close to the facts as possible, but, you know, any Hollywood endeavor is really a pretty big committee, <laughs> you know, and uh, many, uh, the farther up the ladder the project goes, the, the uh, more diverse the voices uh, and opinions and more influential they are and in the, in the outcome. So as time went on, um, there were departures that not everyone's been happy with, but in the end, I think um, there, it still remained as a product that, uh, in, in to a large extent, uh, communicated the uh, emotional impact it had on us when we experienced it. And, you know, that was the main uh, purpose in, in agreeing to the movie. And, uh, you know, I sort of knew from the start it wasn't going to be a docudrama. Hollywood doesn't do that. And anybody who really knows very much about the background of any true life story that's it's made into a Hollywood movie knows that they very rarely stick strictly to the facts. It's just, you know, Hollywood is full of creative people and they like to be creative. <laughs> so, but like I say, it, you know, the net effect was, was good. Um, it would be nice if uh, certain things hadn't gone so far afield, but that's uh, hindsight. Well, looking back on the experience, in a way, it's, it's, it was such a shocking and anomalous thing in my life that it, it just stands out as, in some ways it seems like yesterday because it, it just looms so powerful in my life. But I just have to keep reminding myself from time to time just how much time has gone by because, you know, uh, it's 34 years this fall and wow, that's a long time. And yet, so much of my life has been determined by that one decision to get out of that truck. And uh, I definitely, if I had it to do over again, would not get out of the truck. And that's not to say that I view the ensuing events as 100% negative. It's just that, uh, you know, even, even finding some positive things that came out of it all, um, you know, uh, that sort of uh, knowledge, insight, and understanding is, was gained at a, at a pretty dear price. So I'd rather it hadn't happened, actually. 
Well, it would be nice if uh, somehow this could be turned into something uh, that would have a really positive effect in uh, in promoting, you know, understanding and you know, just betterment of, of humankind. I, I'm sure that's a, a goal everybody would uh, would want. When I'm talking about my experience, I try not to um, interpret or you know project um, you know my own surmising or anything like that because you know or if I do that, I try to label it as so because uh, I you know so much of what happened to me is like a fragment of something that's it's just really too incomplete to me uh, to draw conclusions about and so you know I think the the fairest examination you know is if I you know, leave it open to analysis later. Maybe, maybe uh, with more information and more knowledge, uh, I'll be able to draw more conclusions in the future. From the time I got out of the truck and, and you know, left the crew, uh, you know, they were yelling at me to get away from there. You know, it was a rather impulsive thing to do, and I was regretting it almost as quickly as I did it. And uh, the things that they were saying and the feeling of uh, impending danger, you know. Even some of the guys in the truck said that they, it just felt like something was about to happen, you know. They just had that feeling that they were of something impending, you know. And I don't know, I, I guess I had that feeling too. And I really slowed down as I approached it and uh, had a, <laughs> a lot of misgivings about what I was doing. There was a kind of a weird feeling in the air, which may have been some sort of staticky electrical field, or maybe magnetic or something. But at the same time, there was a, there was a the the sound was just extended off of both ranges, uh, the high and the low of human hearing, you know, to where the the lows were something you really felt more than than heard, and and the the. You know, the highs were kind of like something that was like inside your head rather than coming through your ear. It was just such an intense sound and, uh, with a wide range of frequencies there. But the, the men in the truck kind of felt a vibration that, uh, you know, seemed to shake everything. And maybe that's what contributed that feeling that something was about to explode or something was about to happen. And it may have been nothing more than just a buildup of electricity or some sort of charge of energy of some kind in this craft. That when I raised up and, and created, uh, narrowed the gap between my body and, and it, that being the closest thing there, caused this discharge that uh, injured or did whatever to me. You know, some people speculate that uh, the reason I was kept so long was that maybe they were just, you know, Take, took that long to repair the damage, you know. But I don't know. You know, some people think it was a deliberate shot and that they, you know, did that for the purpose of taking me. But I really do think it was more uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time by getting too close. Yeah, uh, interest or at least obliga obligation of some kind, you know. Um, if it, if it was unplanned and it was just something that happened because of my unexpected approach, then that would explain it. But, uh, you know, how much planning or deliberateness it was on their part, I, I, I guess there's a part of me that just prefers to not think that there was anything, you know, that I was set apart or chosen in any way because, you know, that, that might mean that it's not over or something. And I like to think that it's definitely 34 years in the past. Some people have speculated that, uh, that I'm, there may have been some sort of time contraction uh, perception on my part because I recalled such a short period of time. But then on the other hand, it might have been just that I was unconscious uh, most of the time and became conscious either shortly after I was brought aboard or shortly after I was uh, uh, let off, uh, or somewhere in between, and uh, that maybe, oh, and then another possibility is there was conscious parts that I can't recall, you know, during that five days. But uh, that that would uh, that would be disconcerting if that were the case. I did have some pretty vivid dreams at, at one period, you know, right after the you know the movie, 
came out and I was doing a lot of talking about it again after so long of not that it you know was bringing a lot to to the front of my mind and maybe that's just what inspired these dreams I had some extra vivid dreams uh, that were different than my memories but uh, you know could have been just dreams oh hmm Probably the only euphoria I felt was that finally I'm out of there, <laughs> at least that I can recall, you know. There may have been other periods in the five days, if there was any other conscious period where I had a different mood or different act attitude towards it, but all I can remember is a lot of fear and, and relief when it was over. Well, you know, a lot of people that have experiences of this sort, you know, report, you know, feeling like they're on a mission or they you know, chosen for some important destiny, but, you know, I, I haven't come to that conclusion. I, I do feel that I, I you know, do, do have an obligation to try to make it something that's uh, as beneficial to, to my life and to the lives of those who uh, hear about it as I, as I can, but I wouldn't really call it a mission, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, comes with the territory. You, you know, I have a unique perspective that I, that I need to share, and, it only goes so far. When I woke up, um, I was, I, I didn't come to very quickly. I was in and out for quite a lot of time. I was in a lot of pain, so I, I, it took me a while to kind of gather my thoughts and figure out where I was, which at first I thought was just a hospital, you know. I remembered the incident in the uh, woods, um, eventually, but I thought, oh, maybe I'd just been hurt and they'd taken me to a hospital. And the sounds of movement around me, I just went, oh, that's the doctors. And, you know, when I finally got where I could focus my eyes and saw them is when I just flipped out because, you know, seeing these things was and it, it just a, it was just a real shock because, you know, I'd never seen anything like that. And at the same time, I'm having all this pain and this feeling of suffocation, which just kind of gave me a panicky feeling to start with. So that that explains a lot of why uh, why I reacted to what some people think is so so badly. You know, people say, "Well, I would just remain calm and ask them this question and that question," but I guess. Uh, Everybody has their own <laughs> approach to things. Maybe they'd be surprised at how they would react. But uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the things I recall don't really make a tremendous amount of sense by themselves. Uh, uh, I was looking for a way out and was eventually taken out by a person I took to be human. It may have been. Uh, but uh, um, I wasn't getting any answers. I thought this meant I'd finally, you know, have some understanding of what was happening to me. But they, uh, all they did was uh, want to apparently <laughs> get me unconscious as quickly as they could. There was a room in which there were uh, points of light against a dark background. Now, I don't know whether this was like a planetarium where you're projecting points of light on a dark uh, surface or if this was some sort of a device of projecting a view of what was outside the craft at that moment. But uh, I do know that when you moved the controls on the, on the chair, um, it could cause the pattern to move. All the stars moved in unison. They didn't rearrange their pattern. They moved, and that was really disorienting because it was all around. It was projected even on the floor, so uh, I didn't want to do that again, and uh, so I left that alone. But um, I went. I don't know if I'd call that a star map, but it really seems like why would anybody need that? You know, to me, it seemed like if they were more technological, maybe it would just be nothing but a bunch of numbers. But I don't know. It looked like a very direct sort of uh, control of that craft. Just there were a button, you know, it press. And uh, there was a screen there that there were black lines on it, long black lines that 
that covered the entire screen from one end to the other with little segments on them. And they would change angle and sort of move, but there was no symbols, no reference. So why, why would this line need to slide up and slide like this if there's no symbol to designate where it is? But the buttons seem to change that. So I don't know, maybe it was the, what was enclosed by that that had meaning to them. But there was no symbols, no lettered numbers. <sighs> kind of a funny thing there, but um, I, uh, you know, kind of the better, my better judgment was to stop messing with that. I could make things worse for myself. So it was with uh, great relief that this human looking individual came in and took me out of there. You know, I ran up screaming, you know, babbling all kinds of questions, but I, um, you know, wasn't getting any response. It wasn't like it was just robotic or anything. It was a little bit of maybe wincing when I was yelling or something, <laughs> but, and uh, a sort of a faint smile, but very little reaction. Uh, but it was like a, more of a subdued or suppressed reaction as he took me out of there. It, was, it wasn't unkind or hostile, but it wasn't real encouraging as far as getting any information out of me. But I figured maybe he'll tell me when we get out of here, take that helmet off, whatever. But uh, the people who were dressed like him that he left me with um, weren't any more informative. They didn't answer anything. No sounds. It's almost like they didn't want to, you know, they, to have the most minimum kind of interaction that they could with me. For because they were hiding something or because I was in such a crazy state, I don't know, but uh, that's the way it seemed to me. But I was just glad to find myself outside the craft and in more familiar surroundings. And, uh, you know, I wasn't <laughs> regretting having uh, not solved any mysteries or anything. I just wanted to be out of there and back home as quick as I could. Next thing I can recall after the experience is, is waking up on the roadway outside of Heber and uh, making my way into the town and trying to find a telephone that worked. And I went into these telephone booths and, the, and I went into the first one and picked up the phone and, and it was out of order, which uh, kind of made me feel <laughs> this surge of desperation. What if these phones don't work? But the next one did work. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, nowhere on the mountain in any of those towns around there are there any more phone booths. But those phone booths are still there. They're kind of like uh, been preserved all this time uh, because the uh, telephone operator listened in on the call and, and then knew for a fact that, uh, you know, the report came from there. This is an answer to the skeptics' charges that I was really at my mother's house in Snowflake or at some other place. But, you know, the sheriff found out from the phone company that that call was made from that phone booth at that time. So um, we have a, a row of phone booths there in Heber, <laughs> the only ones left on the mountain. Well, at that time, you didn't even have to have a coin to talk to the operator, and so you just pick it up and dial O, and, and you can talk to the operator. They can't do that now because they would be kept constantly busy with people taking advantage of that. But that's the way it was at the time. So I made a collect call to my family, and operator listened in reported it to the sheriff, who sent a man right out there who got there right after my family did and picked me up and took me back to Snowflake. When I was returned, I didn't encounter my uh, co-workers, any of them, for several days. My brother uh, had become extremely concerned about my welfare because of the, the mob, the, the circus that was going on in town. The, you know, the intrusions and, the, and of course, some of the phone calls were kind of sinister too. There were some warning calls about people that, 
you know, there was a woman who was a nurse who said uh, there was an elderly couple who had had an experience like this in a hospital where she worked, and when she went off shift, uh, they were there, and when she came back, they were gone, and all records were gone, too, and everybody was saying, no, what are you talking about? So, you know, they said, J she said, just be aware of that, and then this other guy called, he said he was in the CIA, and again, warned. Don't let him, you know, just be handed off to the authorities. So my brother took that to heart and, and uh, kind of kept me away from everybody for a while, for a few days, which, you know, naturally upset the sheriff, but it also kept me away from my coworkers, which had me doing a lot of reality testing, you know. These people are all saying I'm crazy and acting like I'm crazy, you know. I didn't have their corroboration like it would have been if I would have said, yeah, you know, we went through this. It would have been a lot easier for me to, to you know, not do this reality testing and say, you know, do more coping with, the, with what happened than wondering whether it did or not. You know, every authority figure around me trying to tell me, no, it didn't happen, you know, and uh, everything in my mind told me it did. did. So when I finally did uh, meet up with the rest of the crew later, it was very helpful. And, uh, you know, as time went on, you know, more of the um, outside evidence, independent evidence, uh, came back uh, to me. You know, a lot of it was kept away from me, things the sheriff was aware of and things that went into his file that, uh, you know, people who were in the area, hunters and campers and people who had seen things uh, that he was aware of, he never told me about. So, um, as time went on, it, it got slowly better. But it's something, the trauma of which has just never completely left me. And, you know, there's still a certain amount of coping to do, even to this day. And uh, I'm, something uh, has a tendency to cause my mind to want to go somewhere else, uh, you know, once I've been on the subject. And I guess I've kind of reached that point with this interview, too. <laughs> you know, people who have had similar experiences or I recall having had such experiences will ask me, what should I do? You know, I really hesitate to advise them because, you know, on the one hand, it's it's it been, you know, real cathartic to, you know, have this uh, validated in some sense by uh, researchers and people with similar experiences. But on the other hand, I've subjected myself to a, to a lot of flack over the years that really been a heavy price that I've been aware of every single day, you know, working amongst people that you know, there's always an undercurrent there. It helps that uh, I can overcome it just by being me, just keep on being me, and then eventually they, you know, have to do a double take. They have all sorts of uh, preconceptions that I'm finally able to shake them out of. But it's the fact that those uh, prejudices exist before I even meet somebody that has been a continual obstacle in my life. But uh, as time goes on, the more and more people who have an opportunity to know the real me can relate what they've learned to, to other people. You know, a lot of people were claiming to have been my best friend or, you know, we were buddies in high school and all this stuff and people I barely knew. So, and, you know, they, they're an authority on me and my character, you know. Uh, for the good or for the bad, either one, but, you know, they want to say they had close ties. Sometimes it's kind of funny. Mike Rogers was in a place one time, and this guy was bragging how he knew Mike Rogers and Travis Walton, knew all about him, and Mike was standing right there, yeah, I know them guys, you know, they're like this and like that, you know, and Mike just kind of smiled himself, didn't ever let the guy know that <laughs> that was him. And uh, I kind of take it that way, too. You know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, you look a lot like Travis Walton. And I say, I get that all the time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something I, I try to live a normal life. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as the family is concerned, uh, we, you know, I just don't let it dominate the, the, the topic all the time. And, 
you know, it's not like it's some hush-hush or taboo thing, but, uh, you know, we just try to live our day-to-day -day lives without uh, dwelling on the subject. Well, you know, having gone through what I've gone through in my life, um, it gives me a kind of unique uh, perspective uh, 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 at a dear price, but, uh, I, you know, I think I've gained a lot of insight. It's, it's sort of like being on the outside looking in in some ways. Um, I've get, got a lot of insight into uh, uh, people, human nature, you know, how, uh, how our minds uh, go through some real backflips when confronted with, uh, um, you know, information or, or evidence that we don't want to uh, accept, uh, the, you know, the conclusion to which it's leading us. So um, I think we could all use a little more maturity in that area that, uh, you know, we're just willing to let the, uh, let the facts direct us uh, to wh whatever, you know, whatever is. Uh, I've, I've learned, I've gained a lot of insight about, uh, you know, the so-called experts, uh, you know, that in many ways, uh, uh, there, there's, there's some people who have a lot of inside information, but they're not necessarily the ones that are ostensibly in control, you know. On the face of it, the people who we take to be our, quote, leaders are just really figureheads that, uh, are just uh, riding the same wave we are. <laughs> They're, uh, you know, this train's barreling forward and there's nobody driving. <laughs> but, uh, you know, each of us have our, our own uh, ability to uh, sort of direct things if we uh, quit uh, uh, adopting the attitude of let George take care of it. You know, we all have a certain responsibility to try to shepherd the truth when we can. and. Uh, do our part. You, can't, you know, we might not be able to affect everything and everybody, but you know, for our part, it's better to be part of the solution than part of the problem. And uh, as I was discussing earlier, um, I've come to realize that in the field of ufology and this general topic, that there's a, a, a real unevenness in the quality of the investigative uh, procedures being followed. And I think it would be very helpful if uh, there were some sort of a, uh, a guideline or set of guidelines that uh, everyone agreed on would be the proper way to conduct an investigation or to evaluate a, a given case. And so, you know, having gone through this directly, I think uh, that I might even take that upon myself, um, not just to be the sole author of these, you know, suggestions or guidelines, but maybe to, you know, take the input from as many investigators as possible, and uh, maybe correlate these into a, and digest those into a coherent whole, and then and then put that back out to these investigators for critique, and and uh, in the end maybe uh, get some uh, consensus on uh, the best way to, uh, you know, investigate and, and evaluate various cases as they come forward.